Huddersfield's German defender Christopher Schindler has unbearable responsibility on his shoulders. Right footed Schindler yes. scores the goal that fires Huddersfield to wow, wow, wow. into the Premier League. Well, it's all about Carlin Grant's touch, then his touch, his turn, that little bit of pace to get away from the defender. Get up. Another piece of individual for Lynch from Carlin Grant. Never in doubt. Side foot, thank you very much. Back of the net. the winning goal, please be the winning goal. You could not allow Kyle Grant to come back on his right foot on that side of the 18-yard box. There's only one thing that happens. And I'd like to say, I think that's the three points. Okay, so as, as usual, this episode is sponsored by Magic Rock Brewing. Uh, sadly, at the moment, Magic Rock is closed due to the uh, coronavirus outbreak, but the Welcome Centre, who are very close to uh, what Magic Rock do, are still open and uh, if you've got a little bit of spare money ha hanging around at the minute they uh, are taking a couple of donations for people who are struggling at the moment so uh, have a check of uh, the HTSA uh, website and social media uh, as well as the Cowshed Loyal and uh, if you can help out that'd be fantastic and uh, and hopefully we come out of this uh, quite soon. Right welcome to another special lockdown episode of the Andy Takes That Chance podcast. Uh, this week we've got a goalkeeping special I'm your custodian, Matt Shaw, and with me today, I've got a safe pair of hands in Richard Cozzy Kuzmala, as well as good distribution from the back by Brady Frost and Simon Copeland. Uh, joining us today, dominating his box on Zoom, is former Huddersfield Town goalkeeper and current BBC Radio Leeds match summariser, Matt Glennon. Good evening. How are you doing, Matt? How are you coping then with uh, lockdown? Obviously, everybody is very different, but how are you finding the, the current situation? Uh, a bit mixed, really, for me. Obviously, I've gone from uh, my hairdressing salon and to the BBC to me show on a Monday night to my goalkeeping academy to, to match days to absolutely nothing so it was a bit a bit strange at first from going from 50, 60, 70 hours to, to nothing uh, but I'm getting some good quality time with my girls getting plenty of cooking done getting out with the dogs getting some fitness in there uh, so yeah the sun's shining the grass has been cut on more times already this year than it has done for the last three so I'm just, I'm just getting on with it, doing what I'm told, staying at home, staying safe like you're supposed to be doing. It's not easy at times because you, you want to go out, you want to speak to people, you want to do things, but you just got to do what the, what the experts tell you, which is basically stay at home. Absolutely. So thank you for, for giving up your time and joining us today. I know you've, you've, you're obviously still busy despite being at home. So uh, what I thought would be quite fun is if we have like a, a walk through your, your career and how you got to Huddersfield and a little bit after uh, and then we'll move on and uh, and chat about more recent recent things and uh, and football today as well. So, uh, I saw on on Twitter a couple of days ago. Uh, similar to me, you grew up with a a fondness for Peter Shilton. Um, yes, yes. Growing up, was he your, your? He was actually. I think I'm I'm two or three years younger than you, but he was my main inspiration growing up, as well as Steve Hardwick, who played for Huddersfield at the time, was my first Huddersfield goalkeeper. Uh, but he was one of my favourites growing up. And uh, was he your main inspiration? Uh, and did he, so, as, a, as a young goalkeeper, and he, was he one of the reasons why he, uh, he wanted to stand between the sticks instead of fire the ball in? Uh, yeah, he was. Well, one of the main reasons was I don't like heading it and I don't like running. So uh, going in goal was, was quite an easy decision for me. Uh, yeah, he was obviously playing for England at the time. I had the yellow goalkeeper jersey that he wore in uh, Italian 90. And also then another Peter, Peter Schmeichel, was just coming, uh, coming into the fold as well. And it was just uh, an accumulation of... Lots of goalkeepers, Keith Brannigan at Bolton. I was only a young lad then yeah. when he was there as well. And uh, local football, I mean, Stockport, Stockport County. Uh, and Paul Cooper, he played for Stockport a little bit. He's a, a real blast from the past. He was actually in Peter Shilton's book. Uh, there, was, there was numerous ones around at the time. And even my Sunday League goalkeepers, you know what I mean? I was good friends with, with, me, with the lads on uh, Aswood United in Stockport, where I'm right. from. And he just built from there. And... Unlike any sportsman, really, when you're good at something, you stick with it. And I was all right in goal. It didn't fly past me too much, so I stayed there. And you got picked up, didn't you, by Bolton quite quite quickly? Was that, I think sort of going back to, to then, it probably wasn't quite the academy football that we know today, but was it when a case of you get picked up at around about 14 years old and, 
and then you'd be you'd be in the system. No, it was a bit earlier than that. I was at I, went, I was at Blackburn first for a little bit uh, when I was about 12, 13, but it was a long way, long way from Stockport for my dad to take me on a, a Monday night for training and things like that. So and then Bolton saw me uh, playing for a team called Cheadle Town actually at the time and it was an adults team I think I was only like 12, 13 playing for them because uh, I was uh, quite a tall lad then they come down again it was still a good hour away in the car uh, as you said not the same kind of academy at all I sometimes would get the train there myself get home at 11 o'clock at night 13 years of age so you get a bus a train then get picked up get your expenses a few quid and train then you, you play your games on a weekend it was uh, yeah it wasn't quite as formal as it was, no, and then I could also play for my Sunday league team, play for my school, play for representative team, Great Manchester. It wasn't there. You play for Bolton, and that's it. You're not playing any football for anyone else. Well, I, I played upwards of five, six games a week. That's that's very different to to obviously today, where you get sort of locked down almost, don't you? In in terms yeah. of the academy, um, when when you joined Bolton, you um, I'm just sort of looking at the early part of your career there, and. You've you've played really for two interesting managers really early on, and I would imagine you would you would have learned a lot from. And one of them, Sam Allardyce, you know, at Bolton, sort of maybe latterly there, and yeah. and Ian Holloway at loan spell at Bristol. What what were they like? I can imagine there's a couple of different yeah. different characters there. And there's a there's a good story of Sam Allardyce yeah. at Huddersfield as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sam Sam was brilliant. I was with Sam for quite a bit, to be fair. He kept sending me on loan, and then he sold me. Uh, but he, I had a, a really good relationship with him. Uh, Apart from the small small spell where he banned me from the club for about three months when I was on loan at Carlisle, because uh, I wouldn't sign for Ian Holloway at uh, Bristol Rovers. When I was great, training was good. It was thorough. You enjoyed it. You knew where you stood with him. If he didn't like you, you knew he didn't like you. He didn't make any secret of it. He didn't talk behind your back. None of the stuff that uh, happens a lot more these days. He, he, he was very, very straight with you. And then Ian Holloway, brilliant. I just went there, but I was only there for a couple of weeks. I got a phone call on a Friday, Friday morning. Uh, the goalkeeper's injured. You need to come make your league debut for Bristol Rovers versus Wigan. Got the train down there. Got 11 o'clock at night. Played the game. Nil-nil. Man of the match against Wigan. And then didn't play the next game. He had a lad on loan from Man United who had to play. It was in his contract. So I, ju- I just got called straight back to Bolton. And and that was it, to be fair. It was a short spell within Holloway. And then on to Hull as well. I think Hull's where, where you met your wife. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's Hull's right. That so, uh, um so uh, probably some good memories from over over in Hull, I would guess. Well, yeah, you have to say that. Obviously, that's where <laughs> I, met the, I, met, I met the wife. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it was. I got sold. I got sold to Hull. Uh, I was in a bit of a a tricky a tricky place at the time there, and uh, away from football, things weren't going fantastically well. I got the move there, living in a hotel uh, with a group of lads. It was fun. Got injured quite quickly though. Put way too much weight on uh, as a twenty one year old boy and. Uh, ended up moving on from there but yeah it was a good set of lads Brian Little was fantastic Brian Little one of the nicest men in football great fella to play football for it just I got injured at the wrong time in my personal life and professional life and it was a, a short a short spell at Hull really and when Jan Mulby came in uh, we clashed a couple of times let's put it that way and you, you've ended up at Carlisle, and this is probably where most people will have start to have seen you. I would guess you, you know, at Carlisle, you've you played in the football league trophy final, which I think was at Cardiff, wasn't it? Not not quite Wembley. Yeah, um, that must have been a great experience. To be fair, playing what I would imagine it was against Bristol, so I'd imagine there'd been quite a large contingent from Bristol, wouldn't they? Um, so it mu- must have been a really good, uh, really good uh, part of your career. It was well. I'd, I'd been on Carlisle on loan uh, when I was still at Bolton. I'd gone on loan there for uh, quite a few days. It was in the Michael Knighton days. And Michael Knighton, as everyone knows, isn't the, you know, I mean, the straightest of people when it comes to comes to football. It was an interesting an interesting club at the time. Uh, and then went off to Hull, came back to Carlisle a little heavier than when I left the first time. That was pretty, uh, that way. Uh, and yeah, really enjoyed it. Roddy Collins there, the Steve Collins, the boxer's brother. Absolute, yeah. uh, a great fellow, but... Yeah, not not the full ticket. Let, let's put it that way. He was he was just in the middle of building his boxing ring to fight me in just before he got sacked. So, oh, even though I didn't want to get sacked, I'm quite glad he did because I would. Uh, yeah. this, this nose, which I managed to keep straight in 22 years of football, I don't think it would be uh, from then on. But yeah, it was Millennium uh, Millennium Stadium, as you say. I think there was about 40 or 50 thousand there. There was I think Carl out of 13, 14 thousand. But my first daughter had only been born. I think six days before that as well. So I played a game, 
gone back to Carlisle. Everyone had gone down to Millennium. I'd gone back to Carlisle, then drove down to Millennium and say she was six days old, played the game, then back up there. But yeah, it was a, a great experience. We didn't win the game, didn't have masses to do, to be fair. And all honesty, the pitch wasn't fantastic either. I think someone forgot to uh, chuck the lawnmower over it the, the day before, but it was a, a great experience. I'd imagine. And, and I think at Carlisle's probably the first time you maybe played. Was that maybe the first time you played against Huddersfield? I remember one game where you, you came to um, what was pro- probably the Galfarm Stadium back then and you played uh, for Carlisle. I think it was in League Two. I'm just wondering if you remember the triple save that you made from Andy Booth that day. I was, that was that when you signed for Huddersfield, that the first thing I remember was, oh, that's that guy that made that triple save from Andy Booth where it kind of like, it was about two yards out, wasn't he? And I'd imagine you gave him some stick over that one. Well, yeah, well, I still speak to Booty a lot now. I, I did a night with him a, a few weeks ago, raising money for the pedal for pounds. I do remember it, yeah. I think it was something like 19 saves in the first half. Andy Oles was even shooting from right back. Everyone was having a go. Uh, yeah, it was that was the game that got me to Huddersfield. It may be a year later, but uh, <clears throat> Boothy tries to credit himself for getting me to Huddersfield because he said to Jacko, "Oh, why don't we get that the, get that keeper who made that triple save?" I think that was more to do with the fact of saying his was his whistles weren't that bad. I was doing quite good. I think that's what he was uh, that's what he was trying to imply. But yeah, I've got a little bit to thank Boothy for, but I don't like to give him too much credit. Uh, I remember the game very very well, and I think we could. We nearly nicked a 2-1, if I remember rightly. That would have been the biggest scandal in football. Yeah, it was a bit... Uh, it would have been. But you, you had a spell in Scotland first, didn't you? And, and you yeah. sco- scored for St. Johnston as well. I think there's a, a YouTube video somewhere, isn't there, where someone behind the goal, a little bit grainy, isn't he, on an old, like an old Nokia 8210 yeah, or something, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, where you can kind of see. And I think it's a bit of a twist in the box, isn't it? And then and he's kind of rifle it in. from. from well, if, you've not, if you've not seen it, it's a 25-yard screamer into the top corner. If you've seen it, it's about eight yards out. Jason Scotland ducks for some strange reason, lands on the thigh and flies in. And yeah, it was a, it was a, a very a strange one. But Scotland was brilliant, but only for a year. I couldn't stay there any longer than that. It was too cold. And in all honesty, you didn't get as paid as much as you did in England either. But it was great to go and play Celtic and Rangers and Hearts and Hibs. And it was before the, the real big crash of 2008 as well. So clubs still had money up there because uh, there was a lot of foreign investment and everything in the Scottish Premier League at the time and there was full stadiums and it was just fantastic to play in those big, big games. But as I say, a year, a year was enough. I took my lawnmower with me to the rented house that I, I went to. Absolute waste of time because I never saw the garden. What would, you, what would you prefer then, Celtic Park or Ibrox? I've got a cousin who supports Rangers, so... Ibrox all day. Ibrox all I won't day. Tell, we, I won't tell him that then. Yeah. We won the we <laughs> up for 51 minutes against Celtic. You could hear a pin drop. And then an old mate of mine, Alan Thompson from Bolton, came on, stuck to in the top corner, the place erupted. But at Ibrox, from the minute you drive up to the minute you're warming up to half time to after the game, they just never, ever stop. And the hairs on your back of your neck, you know what I mean? Just never, never go down until you leave the stadium. Yeah, it's a great, great old ground, isn't it? And, and this, 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 this is then that the move to Huddersfield comes about, so we can get on to... Um get onto Huddersfield Town. You took the number 27 as well. So just, just let us know how, um, how it came about that you signed for it. Obviously, you, you made the triple save from, from Boothie, which, uh, you know, Boothie had a couple of one-twos there, didn't he? Uh, and then uh, you, you've come, you've taken 27, which is obviously something which has stuck with you. Is, what's the reasoning behind 27 and how did you, uh, how did you get to Huddersfield? Uh, so the 27, as obviously my shops and everything now, Academy's G27. And it's a number I've just liked. Uh, I had it early on when in the loft going through your old shirts. I actually found a Bolton shirt from when I was 18 with 27 on the back. And that's not when I'd originally thought about taking it. Uh, it was just a number I liked. I had a, a good bit of luck at Carlisle with the 27 on my back. Again, in Scotland, I, I had the 27. And when I came down, I said to Jacko, do you mind if I have this number? Paul Rahook wasn't totally sure about that because he got the number one and obviously thought that he might have been starting the season. I knew I was starting the season. So it did cause a little bit of confusion me choosing that, uh, choosing that number. But it's just something that I've ran with and I say now, I actually have it on my business premises as well. And the actual move to, uh, to Huddersfield from Scotland, I say I think Jack would had his eye on me a little bit before then because of that game. And I had quite a decent season for Carlisle that year because, well, we were, we were shy. So I had, a lot, I, had a lot of, I, had lot, I had a lot of work to do. So it does highlight the goalkeeper quite a lot when you're not the best team in the world. Uh, so he'd got in contact with my agent, a uh, fantastic fella who's unfortunately passed now, 
Uh, and it just went from there. And I went to see him, went and got married, went on my honeymoon, come back, signed. And then, uh, as I say, the rest was, rest is history. And two and a, two and a, a third great years there. I don't mention the, the rest of it. I've got to say, the, the, the one thing that probably stands out from that first season is the triple penalty, you know, three penalty saves in, in one game. I think it was against Crew, and then we still ended up losing. Yes. Um, ended up losing 2-1. You saved three penalties. You must have come off that game and just had a look around and thought, come on, guys, I've, I've saved three penalties here, and we've, we've still managed to lose the game. Yeah, well, hopefully, he's not, hopefully he doesn't listen to this, but when Frank Sinclair signed for the, the club, I knew he was going to stick one or two goals past me. You know what I mean? He, whenever you see the on goals records, you always see Frank there, Richard gone. Frank. This is on the DVD, Frank Sinclair, isn't it? Yeah, so. yeah he's on the, always on the DVD. And say so he gave one of the penalties away, put his hands up. I remember him putting his hands up in the air, say, so I'm not in the area. He was about two foot in the area when he did it. And then he got a clip on their second goal as well to, to guide it past me. And yeah, it, it, it wasn't great. It wasn't great. But to say the three penalties was was amazing. It'd just been nice. It would have meant a little bit more. Mm. That that was the season as well that Jacko ended up being sacked, didn't he? And what? how much of that was down to maybe sort of Terry Yorath leaving the coaching staff? And, and was that kind of the big issue? And was Jacko maybe treated a little bit harshly by Ken Davey? Or do you think it was maybe the right decision in hindsight? Oh, no, no. It was a, a, a culmination of Taff leaving, but Jacko having no money. You know what I mean? You, th- you think about the, the squad back then. They're having to use young lads all the time, like Matty Young, great, good, good young players, but they were never going to take us to the championship. They were 17, 18 years of age. They not not played any league football, and they're getting thrown into the game. Do you know what I mean? Uh, Jamie uh, uh, McComb, he's gone now. Ben's gone. Not oh, Jamie. Yeah, yeah, yeah did. McComb comes in as well, and they're just the young lads, and they're getting thrust into a, a decent level of League One football, and we were like what nine, tenth, eleven, something like that. And they were never going to kick on. You didn't even get loan signings. You know what I mean? You couldn't even get anyone on loan because at the time they weren't paying agents either and things like that. So really, exactly the same as Andy Rich. I don't want to skip forward. We'll talk no, about no, it later. For exactly the same sort of thing. If you're not given the finances in a, a division where, you know what I mean, people are spending a little bit of money, then you're always going to be lagging behind. Yeah, I remember th- players like Gary Hooper, Jason Scotland, all, I think, were all kind of like earmarked. But then... Yeah. I remember hearing one story from about Ken Davey. Who we had Tom Clark at the club and he was paid X amount. So he didn't see the point in giving someone Gary Hooper the same age, uh, the same money as, as Tom Clark. So I do remember money was, it was definitely tight, shall we say, at, at that moment. And I think Ken Davey had expectations of playoffs as well. So uh, it, it did seem that the expectations and the investment didn't quite align there as well. But obviously Andy Ritchie's Fallen the same way. Jerry Murphy's come in, hasn't he? And had a couple of spells there. And he, he seemed to be a bit of a calm and influence did, did Jerry Murphy as well. But well, they were all his young lads, weren't they? They were all his, they were a lot of them were his players. They knew him. They'd known him since they were 10, 11 years old. You know, Andy Olsen, Nathan Clark, some people. So it was a familiar face for them. But it wasn't there like when Stan came in and Stan came and stamped his foot down. And he'd been given the remit, obviously, to shake things up a little bit, which he most definitely did uh, mm-hmm. when he came in. But Andy Ritchie, again, Andy Ritchie did well. He, he kept in that mid to higher table a little bit and he got the obviously Chelsea in the FA Cup and, mm. and things like that but again just not that little injection that he needed just to take the club you know in that little bit further Matt yeah. sorry in, in, in that sort of situation uh, your role as a player do you have opportunity to speak to Ken Davey or whoever the person may be and kind of understand the thinking there or is that kind of very much outside your remit no absolutely no chance and you, you wouldn't anyway because you, you, that's one way to get yourself out the door. Uh, you know, I mean, you could speak to Jacko. You could. Well, I did speak to Jacko because I was uh, not the most senior of players, but I was seen as a senior player because I've always looked forty years old. So everyone thought I was older than that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we would have little chats and things like that. Plus, your agents would say, "Oh yeah, Matt, he was going to come, but they won't pay his fee, so he's not coming." Uh, and it was just just little conversations like that. Really, now you you wouldn't really go near any of the the directors or the the chairman's booty probably could because you know what I mean he's a, a legend at the club and he, he would but he's not that kind of person anyway mm. so 2008-9 um, Dean Hoyle comes in and there must, have, there must have been kind of a sea change at that point because we've got Stan Turnant in and I'm sure you've got some good stories about Stan Turnant as well and I did hear someone call him Stan Tyrant at one point uh, so you've got Stan coming in you've got Dean Hoyle spending money uh, how did that feel because you were still very much part of the, the team at that point uh, how, how was that season under Stan it was a bit as a fan, it was a bit frustrating because we brought in Gary Roberts, who was 
quality, you know, quality football. And we brought in Dickinson, Steve Jones, and all these different sort of players, David Unsworth, Lachetti. And everything was kind of exciting. And it was the centenary year, all the season ticket sales. Uh, how was it for you playing in that side? And, and there must have been some kind of a, maybe an increased pressure as well. Uh, no, there wasn't an increased pressure. Uh, it was just another manager coming again. We'd had a bit of a change with Jerry, with Andy, with Andy Ritchie, with Jacko, and it was a bit up and down. Stan came in. Stan wasn't the tyrant everyone thought he was. He'd obviously been told to mix things up. There's a lot of young lads in there, go in there, ruffle a few feathers. Uh, Ronnie Jepson, the same. I mean, Ronnie had obviously been told it because Ronnie was a bit uh, sour faced as well, which Ronnie isn't. Ronnie's a great fella. I speak to Ronnie now, so you know what I mean? He, he's, he's brilliant. And they'd obviously been told. You know what I mean? Go in there, toughen these lads up, which they didn't really need to. They just needed a bit more guidance, a bit more coaching, a bit more, a, a, good, a good way of playing, a real, you know what I mean, structure, how to, to get the best out of everyone. It came in a bit, you know what I mean? Uh, it, was a, it, was, it was mad. You know I mean? it, it was a mad time. Pre-season, you start at 10, 10, 30, you finish at 12, 30, you have an, an hour and a half eat dinner, you go to the gym or you do a technical session. We were training at half 10, we were racing back stalls all, jokingly, to see how early we could get back to the changing room. I remember getting back to the changing room in pre-season before 11.30. It was, it was mad. And I wonder why lads weren't fit enough and there was injuries getting picked up. Because we didn't, we didn't do enough training. We didn't do, we didn't do enough work. It was, uh, it was okay, a really, really good back, time. It, Matt, you, what, were Andy, uh, what were Andy Ritchie like as a, as a manager? I always felt as a fan, he, he, would never ins- he looked like a guy, uninspirational character. You know, I know that's what he was, a good footballer, but I thought at that time, mate, if I'd have been going to work for someone like Andy Ritchie, unless, as you were telling me differently, just, you know, motivation. I don't think I could get motivated by him, and I think the team kind of played like that. Oh, no, you would, you would. Uh, he's one of those characters that, you know, when you, you wear, like, people talk about Alan Shearer, and they say, oh, he's, he looks like that quiet, serious face, but then you actually, you, you get to turn away from football. Like, I've got friends who play for Newcastle. And he's the life and soul of the party. He organised everything. He's a jokester. When in front of the camera, you think, bloody hell. You know what I mean? You could talk last night to sleep. Whereas, you know, I mean, Andy Ritchie, it was great. Training was lively. It was sharp. He joined in training as well. He'd listen to the players. He'd talk to players as human beings as well. And then he'd have a go when he needed to. But it also, it also, you know what I mean? When he was having a go at you, there's, there was always a, a meaning behind what he was saying. He didn't just rap and rave and scream. He always had a, a, a reason for why it'd be it uh, maybe a strip off you or something like that. And no, he was he was he was good. He was good value for money. And he, but again, he was someone who didn't have the the finances to to get the players and take the club forward. So he was he was always banging his head against the brick wall. It's interesting that because I, I from my point of view as well with Cosy, I think and his interviews afterwards, he would always come across as quite dour, but. I remember watching a, a crossbar challenge on Soccer AM and he was right in there with the lads, you yeah, know, yeah. sort of life was, and soul. Right. Yeah. yeah. He joined in training. You know what I mean? He still knew where the back of the goal was mm. as well. Uh, I was actually due to play a game with him before all this kicked off at Emily with Man United Legends. So mm. he, still, he still smacks the ball around now. He was, uh, no, he was, great to, he was great to get on with, and, but you, you didn't know where the line was with him as well. He did have that. You know what I mean? He, he could be authoritative if he needed to be. I don't know if Cosy wants to tell us about his uh, his favourite game, which was a four-one defeat at Peterborough. Where things <laughs> I'll didn't tell you go. If you want. <laughs> oh, but I'll, t- I'll tell you one thing. I remember though. To be fair, Andy Ritchie obviously had that great cup run, probably the you know the highlight of his career there. And uh, I remember Luke Beckett at the swan song of his uh, career, but he was back. He was a player. I don't know what he trained like, Matt, but he looked like a guy that just kind of old school, kind of Steve Claridge kind of footballer. But he knew how to score on that run. It was fantastic. And even at Stamford Bridge that day, we, uh, we dreamed for a little bit, didn't we? We did. Well, he scored in every round up until uh, Chelsea. And he's obviously the goal at Oldham, he scored against Birmingham. He, he, Luke was my roommate as well. And he was, he was like some geezer you thought, oh yeah, he, he's just down the pub having a few bitters. But uh, he, he didn't know where the goal was. I think he had a, a one in two ratio when he came to, came to Huddersfield. And that was after having a major injury as well. I think he had a full cruciate. Uh, knee ligament reconstruction or something like that as well, uh, obviously which took away whatever pace he had uh, had, had gone before he came to Huddersfield. But he knew he knew how to score goals. He had he had this whip where he just whipped the ball into the back of the net. You just couldn't get anywhere near it. He was he was a he was a good striker, Luke. I thought so. Um, so I think at this point, Matt, you probably want to 
a take a sip of a, a GNT if that's what you've got there, because the the next man that comes in, I think we'll sit back and, and let you tell us about uh, probably not your favourite manager at Huddersfield Town in, in Lee Clark. No, he wasn't, no. Uh, <laughs> when he first came in, it was fine, obviously, because I'd played for two and a half years consistently. I'd only missed the Leeds game. And then uh, Jerry decided to rest me before the before one of the games, and it was the game before Lee Clark came in, so obviously I lost my place. Uh, but Lee Clark comes to done a bit of own work and he pulled me in and said, Matt, I realise you've been playing, you know what I mean, consistently for two and a half years. We just beat Leeds at Ellen Road. We just beat Brighton away 1-0. I saved a penalty in that as well. And it, uh, it was, although not sensational, we were starting to pick up and we'd beaten some decent teams. And then I wasn't playing. Obviously, Alex had come in and they'd won the game, so it's fair enough. You, you keep your place which I'd, I'd expect. But then Lee Clark just, I don't know, uh, I don't go too far with it, but he, he, he wasn't always honest with everything that, uh, you know what I mean, was, was going on behind the scenes and everything. Obviously, I wasn't playing, didn't play for a while. I had my knee surgery. Uh, he said that I could go out on loan. I came in the next day and he sent Eastie out on loan, so I couldn't go out on loan. So it was like, right, I sat there watching. And then uh, there was a few other opportunities as well, which didn't, which didn't arise because I wasn't told about them, even though I got told about them afterwards after the transfer window shut. And so, no, I was not not impressed. But when you're not playing football, you're never going to be impressed anyway. You, if you're not playing on a match day, that was all I ever wanted to do was play. You know, I mean, we sat the afternoons and, and, and that was it. And I, that was taken away from me for longer than it should have been taken away. And then I had good opportunities to leave. People stood in my way. And, yeah, I'm never going to have many great words to say about him, in all, in all honesty, because... It, it was a real downturn in my in my career, and you know, I mean, on the pitch and off the pitch as well. So, yeah, wow. not great. but I will say though, I will say, training was excellent. Derek Fazakli was fantastic. Blackie was fantastic. You know what I mean? And Lee could put a good session on. You know what I mean? Fridays would have this game where you you, you got you took your name and you had different teams and you got money at the end of the month if you won. It was on like five as an envelope and stuff like that. So training was decent, but I was just you know I mean, looking to volume as many times as I could during training because that's the frustration I was feeling at the time. Because, again, I played over 600 games and I didn't start till I was 21 playing first-team football, but I only wanted to play and to be stopped playing and to be lied to as well at, at times over things is uh, never pleasant. Well, Matt, some, um, some goalkeepers have made a career out of, I guess, being substitute goalkeepers, if you like. I'm thinking... Yeah. Stuart Taylor, Richard Wright, lastly in his career. Uh -huh. um, guy could say Joel Coleman at the moment, who spent a number of years on the bench. Is that something that ever you ever considered, or have you, you, the way you saw your career playing out, or is that something you consciously wanted to try and avoid? I wanted to avoid, avoid like the plague, because I just I, I have to play on a week. And my, my personality doesn't allow me to sit and watch football. Uh, maybe if I got the opportunity, maybe 37, 38, a decent club, I might have thought of it. But in my mid twenties to mid thirties, no chance. What, what's the what's the point? It's all about making saves, keeping clean sheets, getting kicked in the face, as you can see has happened a few times. <laughs> you know what I mean? And is and you get that feeling. You set yourself. Uh, you know what I mean? You pull the old arm back there, and the old lazy boy. You've got a beer. You're watching. You know you've done a day's work. You know what I mean? Because you played your game. It's either you know what I mean. You you wanting to really hang yourself because it's been horrendous, or you wanting to celebrate because it's been great. And people say. You can keep a level. You, you can't keep a level in football. You're either high as a kite or low in the snake's belly. And, and that's it. But that, all, those, all those feelings together is what makes football fantastic. It's the same as fans. You know what it's like when you've seen an awful game and you've travelled miles and you think, what have I just spent that money doing that for? And then when you get a last-minute winner against Watford in the Premier League and next thing everyone goes through, the, goes through the roof and it's the best day of your life. Part of me would be quite happy with an awful game right now, Matt. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Cosy, were you going to fire in with something there? Yeah, we're just going to ask Matt, who was the goalkeeping coach at that time? Was it John Vaughan, you know, when he, when he was Lee Clark? Who was your goalkeeping coach? At yeah, he was, he was from, when I, from when I came in, I think. Uh, was he? Yeah, yeah, he was. But... the best uh, goalkeeping coach you worked for, Matt, in, in any of your clubs? Uh, Fred Barber of Bolton was, was excellent. Uh, he, was, he was the one who made me quite a strong character, let's put it that way, because... I remember him at Walsall, Matt. He were uh, he were yeah. quite keeping his day in. Was he yeah, the one? Was he the one who played for Peterborough and used to come yeah. on with a mask? Yes, the old man mask. He was an absolute nutcase. Yeah, <laughs> he he would try and physically, and mentally destroy me on a daily basis when I was at Bolton. But he was he was he was superb. 
Uh, yeah, Vaughan was a, a decent goalkeeper coach at Huddersfield as well. Uh, I've had some good ones. I've had some ones who just want to work and do nothing all day. And I've had ones that you could get talking so you did nothing all day as well. We had a fellow called Jim Blythe at Bolton and Keith Brannigan was superb at getting him talking. If he knew he got Jim talking about something, that the session was over. And I just stood there watching, thinking, Branny's done it again. He's, done, he's, he's wasted another 25 minutes talking about absolutely nothing. Uh, yeah, it, but it's, it is important as well to have a, a goalkeeper coach you get on with it. Uh, Carl Lennigan at, at Halifax. You know what I mean? It took me a couple of weeks to mould him. You know what I mean? To get him to where I needed him to be. Uh, basically stopping me jumping all over the place in my mid-30s. But he was, he was excellent as well because he listened to me. We talked about stuff. We went through stuff. And he was just a good sounding board as well. Uh, that's, that's good. So one thing we asked, we had Ian Dunn on last week, and one thing we asked him was that you must have some, uh, some good stories about the sort of nightlife around Huddersfield and the sort of social aspect and, you know, any sort of pre-season tour, you know, what stays on tour and et cetera. You must have some, some pretty decent stories from there as well. Uh, back in the day, I remember you being a bit of a fan of the Flying Circus in, in Huddersfield as well, which was apparently Did one of your... That? Oh gosh, where where is that now? That's on the is it Crosschurch Street? That one? I, I think I think it's a Lebanese bar or something now or something. I, I'm not from Huddersfield, so someone will have to help me out from. It from was no, we used to go to. Is it uh, the one that's now near near the, around the corner from the casino? It's a gym now, I think. Uh, okay. Was it re re re? No, it wasn't re. I don't know what it's called. Uh, there was what one round one round there, and when we played a Tuesday night game, we'd sometimes go in there uh, for a late one. But Huddersfield. No, not 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 massively, not massively. We do it, again now and again. We we'll go out, and it was more of a daytime thing. We'd organise something. We'd all go, just start drinking at two o'clock on Tuesday afternoon, and then I sit. We just hide somewhere in a bar, and everything. It was like Chris Leggett and all that stuff, and we just sit there play drinking games. And yeah, you could get away with it a little bit more then. You ain't getting away with it. You ain't getting away with it now. You ain't seen Huddersfield's first team sitting in the Aspley. Uh, with loads of bottles of wine playing drinking games and <laughs> with bunny ears and everything else going on and all this sorts of stuff. But it was, uh, we, had some, we had some fun times. Ibiza was one of the best ones because when my, it was the second year they'd gone when I signed, we went, we went over there and I always remember Jacko looking at me and just saying to me, what are you doing? Now, at the time, I was on a lilo eating a mint chop chip ice cream in the middle of the pool and this is pre-season training. And I'm thinking, well, we finished training now, we're working, and that's it. I've got my airy chest out and everything. I just, I was just missing the medallion at the time in the uh, middle of a booth there, and that was it. Was great. And they let us out one night. We had to go back for twelve. So I, we got back at twelve. I made sure everyone got back at twelve. So if you didn't go back at twelve, we weren't going out on the final night. So we go back at twelve. Next thing, Jacko's having his cheeky little uh, fag on the on the on the balcony. It must be two, three in the morning. And these two players who decided not to come back that night. And he stood there watching these two clowns trying to climb up balconies to get into the room so nobody sees them. And in the morning, Taff had seen, Taff had seen him as well. We had to go to the football pitch where we were training and playing. We had to do every line of the pitch and back. I think it was four times in the heat in Ibiza in July. And it was, oh, it was horrendous. I could have killed them, both of them. I'm not going to name them. I think you should. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not going to name Brando. No, I would never. I would never do that. The other one I can't because he's still associated. So I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to name him. We'll leave yeah, Boothy out of it then. So it, we'll uh, we'll move. Oh, we'll... I think we all know it wasn't Boothy. It was <laughs> so, chocolate. Uh, yeah. So um, so on on leaving Huddersfield, um, sadly, I don't know what you did in a previous life, uh, but you know you you were forced to go to Bradford City, unfortunately, oh. and. Uh, oh. So you've got my uh, our sympathies, I think, for for that one, Matt. So uh, I don't think you had a great time there, though, did you? No, it was, it was awful because we had uh, Stuart McCall uh, sign me, and Stuart's a a lovely, a lovely fella, you know what I mean. And then a week later, he left, and that's it. He'd had some wrangling in the boardroom or something like that. I was like, well, what, what's going on here? And then the ultimate goalkeeper hater, Peter Taylor, turns up. <laughs> and it was like, oh no, and like because I'd had him a little bit at Hull and. Paul Musselwhite, a good friend of mine who played for Scunthorpe, played for yeah. Port a lot of games. The nicest, most placid goalkeeper the world's ever known. Even he called Peter Taylor a certain word to his face as well. And when, when Muzzy starts hammering people, then you, you know they're not goalkeeper-friendly people. And he turned up and I just thought, oh, that's me done. And I played, I think I played 17 of the 19 games I was there for. And he, he, he pulled me in the office and says, oh, we can't. 
offer you the money around at Huddersfield. I said, well, I can stop you there. So I'm not playing for you anyway. I said, I can't play for a man like you. And I, I'm, I, if you don't mind, I'm leaving. I'm not coming to the, next, the game tomorrow. And he said, all right, that's fine then. So I just left his office and, and went home. And that was that it. Was, no, it was, the pitch sounds, was sounds amicable, does that? The training pitch was awful. It was. It, you, know, you had to go to Astley Bridge. Like, so, yeah. you know, I mean, you got, That's school, isn't it? We've got decent cars and stuff like that. We're not driving around in, in, in Del Boy's buddy three-wheeler. But you're having to drive in your kit to ask me to 20 minutes, get covered in crap for an hour and a half, get back in your car, drive all the way back there. Then the pitch on the match day, which it is still now, which is horrendous. And you just thought, well, what, what is this all about? Because obviously I've been at Huddersfield and enjoyed me, well, 80% of my time there. And then I was, I was at Bradford and no, I didn't enjoy it at all. Matt, what were the, uh, the support like for them 17 games? Did you feel, because you had the other connection, you, were, you had to kind of fight twice as hard or were they kind of fair with you? No, because I, I, never, I never got that too, too involved, because he tell you the truth, because I was only there for a short time. Stuart McCall had left. He was the big story because he'd, he'd gone. Uh, obviously, Lazarus has come back again. Uh, but it was, it, it, it's, it, was, it was a stepping stone for me. Peter Jackson was supposed to get the job. That was the worst thing about that time at Bradford. Jacker was supposed to be getting the job. He'd got the second interview. It was going through. And then Taylor walked through the door. I might, I might as well have just picked up my boots and my gloves and just walked out of that room right there. And then it was, uh, that was the most disappointing part of Bradford, the fact Jacko didn't get the job. He always mm-hmm. comes across as a bit of a rare, uh, what's my word, sir? He's got small man syndrome massively. <laughs> he was a little yeah. winger and he's, a, he just, he's one of them people. He, he can make an atmosphere in, a, in an empty room. The thing is, Matt, when you watch him on telly, mate, he, he kind of talks to you like, you know, no one's got a clue about football, he's the head teacher, and yeah. obviously, coach. I mean, he had success, obviously, at Alden for a bit, but... He did, and obviously got the England job for a bit, and yeah. he, when he made Beckham the, the captain, I think, and that, which he, he still dines out on. And to talk to him now and again, he was fine, but it just was an atmosphere where you're going into work and enjoying it, and as I say, he, he did not like goalkeepers at all. Said it on the first day, jokingly to me, and... I think it was Nigel Martin was there because he was coaching us at the time and uh, Johnny McLaughlin, who was at Sunderland now, he said, oh, I hate goalkeepers and started laughing. And I thought, yeah, I know you do, you git. And yeah, and he showed us every single day that he did. You had a great spell at Halifax. Uh, you, you sort of helped Halifax move back up the leagues, I think, didn't you, under, under Neil Aspin? Um, I think this, not saying you're winding down your career as much, but you, you kind of, it seemed a bit of a drop, you know, sort of from, from where you were to go to Halifax because they were, Sort of down there. Is this is this about the time you then started to uh, change uh, your occupation a little bit? Because uh, there's not many footballers who are going to hairdressing, is there? No, there's not. No, no, it's true. I, I'd, 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 I'd been beaten up a little bit over a couple of years. In all honesty, with uh, leaving Huddersfield, you know what I mean, was a real something I couldn't let go of. I still probably haven't, if I'm, in all honesty, because I really enjoyed my time uh, at Huddersfield. I mean, my second daughter was born here. I still live here now. You know what I mean? I do my job that I do BBC-wise. but And so it, I, I struggled to get over that a little bit. Then I went back to my hometown club, uh, Stockport County, which was great under Paul Simpson, who had played as uh, Carlisle for. He lost his job. And then uh, Diddy Haman come in. He was fantastic. But then he decided, he, he left. And then an, an, another manager come in and you start, I'm, th- I'm in, what, 32, 33, 34 now. I've got a man who's trying to teach me how to line walls up and, and things like that. And, uh, it was just like I, I have, I've had enough. I'd already tra- I've already retrained as actually a barber when I was at Huddersfield Town. I did that just as I was leaving there, sort of fast tracked my way through that with the help of the PFA and my wife sorted that out for me and things like that. I found a, a training program for me, and I just thought, you know, what I mean, it, before I end up volleying a manager over a over a stand, it might be a good idea for me to start finding other ways of of living my life. So I uh, I found a, a shop to sort of rent the chair in. Halifax came knocking. Uh, David Buzzum were lovely fella, nightmare to deal with when it comes to money and contracts. I just thought, oh, I'm here again. Uh, but Halifax was the closest. It was a good club. David was great. Neil Aspin, I went to meet Neil. I never met Neil before. Now, I know Neil really well now. I've had him on my show. Uh, I speak to him a lot. He's, he's not one for footballers with little, let's say, little bellies. And that's it. And I was, look, I was speaking to him in uh, the, the Shea, and I could see him. He kept looking at my belly. I'd put a couple of pounds on, you know what I mean? Because the pre-season had been there. And I could see, I think, you'll look at my bleeding belly you are. And I, I, knew, he, I knew he was. Uh, but then I signed. It went really well. It took me five games to get my first clean sheet. 
But I got another 24 after that. We got promoted after, uh, I think, 11 games in 22 two days or something like that. It was ridiculous. And then another couple of great years. Then, unfortunately, say, Neil left. And then it was time for me to really start winding down and done because, say, I'd had, a, I'd had enough because I, I really enjoyed working with Neil. He sort of brought me back to, to life football-wise again. And uh, I enjoyed working for him. Matt, how, uh, how important is geography when you're kind of making those decisions? Presumably, you could have perhaps kind of travelled the length and breadth of the country to try and stay in maybe a higher division, gone back up to Scotland potentially. Um, geography play kind of an important kind of process in, in your decision making at that time? Yeah, well, huge. Even the year before, I got offered a, to go back up to St Johnston again, uh, playing the SPL again, and it just what it just wasn't it wasn't the right time. That's actually when I was leave, when I left Bradford, I think it was. They would offered me a really good contract. Go there, but I wasn't moving my family again. I've got a family now, the girls have got a school. I'm not spending the week away from them because for me, there's no point having a family if all you're going to do is spend all your time away from them. And I'm not traveling up and down the motorway uh, at all. And then the Halifax thing, when I decided to start business, it was the closest club with a decent crowd. It had to be a certain standard. I wasn't going to go and sign for a club who might pay me more money, but I'm playing on the field every week and I'm, play, I'm playing in front of 100 fans. It's, not really what I wanted to do. I wanted to still play a decent level, a decent ground, a decent club, but I didn't want all the full-time hassles. I didn't want it to be my main source of, well, I suppose income really, and also not something I can just say is my be-all and end-all. I wanted something a bit different. I've got some questions on, on Huddersfield, really, uh, just to wrap up, just to wrap that up. Um, just, just little quick ones. Who was the best player that you got to play with at, at town? Uh, best player I got to play with. I enjoy. I enjoy playing with a few, a few players. At, uh, Huddersfield, like Danny Schofield, always comes up. It just made the game. You know, what I mean, so easy. It was. It, it was ridiculous for him. Gary Roberts, Pilkington. You know, what I mean, Pilks was a, a great player going into that era with uh, Lee Clark and going through. But uh, yeah, I, I'd say them. But I enjoyed playing with Booty as well. A lot of people say it, but someone who would do the odd bad kick, the odd bad kick, I might add. You know what I mean? He'd always make it a good one. He always brought people into play, always did something. And this is the back end of his career as well. Uh, there, was, there was some good friends as well as, say, good players there as well. Tell you what, Matt, McGarry Roberts, uh, I always thought in my mind, maybe he might even go on and play Premier League, but it just, he just liked that little yard, didn't he? Just to kind of get past players, but he could always make stuff happen. I, I absolutely loved him and he's still doing the business now, isn't it? He is, but don't forget, he's a very strong character, Gary, as well. He was a bit like myself. Like, he wouldn't suffer fools either. The big fallout with Lee Clark and everything like that, where maybe it, it could have gone differently and things like that. It's, it was, uh, I think sometimes he'd, he'd probably move around a bit quicker than you'd, you'd expect because, you know what I mean, he wanted to play football and that's what, that's what Gary did. And he played really well. But as you say, yeah, maybe, maybe that yard, he looked a lot quicker than he probably was if that's a, a good way of putting it. Could you tell Pilks were going all the way to the top, Matt, when you were there? Did you expect him to play Premier League when you... Well, this time? Yeah, I, I remember, because he's a stop ball lad like myself. Uh, so we got talking, and we were, we were doing corners and free kicks. And I always remember playing against Peter Beagrey. And Peter Beagrey would always... You'd line up a wall for a left footer, and he'd change it to his right foot. And there's no different. You're like, you get... And it's like, it's just ridiculous. And we were doing corners, and Pilks did left foot, right foot. And everyone's just stood there going... I'm sure he's done exactly the same there, left foot and right foot. And obviously, he was six foot two. He was quick. You know what I mean? All the assets that, uh, that was needed, really, to make it to the Premier League. And, yeah, he worked hard as well. He's had, obviously, a couple of injuries himself along the way. But he was a good, good player. Do you think some of the younger ones um, were perhaps... Um, I'm thinking the likes of maybe Nathan Clark, uh, Murphy, and Andy Holdsworth. Do you think maybe they were held back a bit by staying at Huddersfield too long, and and maybe they could have gone on and and played at a higher level? I'm thinking like Nathan Clark when Rob Page came in, and they had that combination between the two, and we looked so solid at the back at that point. Do you think maybe a couple of the younger ones stayed a bit too long, and they could have gone on and uh, and played higher? Uh, yeah, definitely. Nathan Clark. I remember so when Page came in, Page was an absolute animal. I think we kept about nine clean sheets in about ten games. It was, yeah. uh, it was, it was, it was stupid. But yeah, Clarkie again, six foot three. You know what I mean? Decent pace. Didn't mind putting his head in there. Hence the amount of scars and stitches he's had along the way, and could play. Maybe, maybe he did stay a couple of years uh, too long. But these lads came through the club from nine, ten years old. They had that bond 
maybe it was a bit, little bit harder uh, to move on than it would be for someone who'd, who'd come in from the outside. Uh, yeah, definitely Andy Holdsworth. You know what I mean? He, he moved on to Alden with Worthy. Both of them got injured. You know what I mean? Alden probably ruined the day that they signed them to. Because yeah. uh, both of them, I think, were out for about eight, nine months when they, when they first went there. Andy Holdsworth, absolute Rolls-Royce of a player, but just didn't quite get to where he could have gone because maybe it was maybe one year, two years longer than he should have done. Uh, that's that's it really for town. Uh, tell us about G twenty seven really. Um, chance to chance to plug it really. It's based up in Emily, isn't it? Um, and and also any tips for people like me who are descending into yetis and wookies, you know, during the lockdown here with hairs. So there's a lot of people letting their other halves cut their hair, but there's no way mine's coming near me. Absolutely not. But any no, tips for any tips for someone like me who's turning into cousin it maybe? There there is. I was a little bit late for my friend at the court today. There's a young lad who works at the court, massive town fan. I walked in today and I was like, what have you done? And he's let his mum cut his hair and he's just uh, the rim around there. And I said, what have you done? And yeah, so I actually told him that I was going to slaughter him on this uh, podcast tonight as well. So he'll be listening later on. Do you want to name him? Go, go longer, <laughs> I'd say. Go longer. Don't, don't, either leave it totally, you know what I mean? Leave it totally. Or just, if you're going to clip it, if you're number two, go for a four or a five. Just be gentle with it. And that's it. Because once you start thinking, Oh, I'm going to do like that, you see. You get a little bit of shine on it, a bit of boot polish, and that's it. <laughs> and you're flying. Well, no, if, you, if, you, if you're a one or if you're a one zero blade, all this sort of stuff, don't go anywhere near it because you'll look like something out of the uh, Three Stooges. I'm only two weeks away from full Jason Davidson, you know, with the top knot and everything. It's, 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 oh, not, no. it's not going well. I just need a pair of boots. Danny Adams, you want, Matt? Danny Adams, mate. You know. <laughs> Danny Adams. <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah. I'm just a pair of Ugg boots away from Jason Davidson at the minute, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Janino Bakuna, his hair, yes or no? No, <laughs> only, because, only, because, only because he annoys me a little bit as well, to be fair. So, because uh, he's so inconsistent, so I, I, I'd love so to know where he, I'd love yeah. to know his colors from because they are bright, he seems it's... to walk them out very well. Okay, so it's a good time here to take a break, and we'll call that part one. Uh, back in part two, Matt talks about uh, more modern affairs, including his his love-hate relationship of Rajiv Van Lepara. So you go on home and you sit in your room and you think, now when and how am I ever going to get away from this? And now you know. Come let your hair down Tonight we will walk these streets I used to walk them alone Now we will walk together Come let my head 